वेलकम टू इ पी जी पाठशाला आई एम ज्योति प्रसाद चैटार्जी एसोसिएट प्रफेसर इन सोशियोलजी बैरकपुर राष्ट्रगुरु सुरेंद्रनाथ कलेज वेस्ट बेंगल इंडिया आई उल वि टकिंग अबाउट भेरियस एप्रोचेस टू सोशल मुभमेंट्स एंड अफकोर्स दिस इज उद इन दि ओवरऑल आई मिन जेनरल पेपर अफ सोशल मुभमेंट्स इन इंडिया so what are the different approaches what are the differences between those approaches that will be the basic uh, motive or objective of this presentation now sociological approaches uh, there are a plain number of sociological approaches to study social movements like the marxist approach the structural functional approach gandhian approach the resource mobilization theory the relative deprivation theory and all these try to explore the dynamics of social movements so the marxists they continue to fuel the working class movements as we know that uh, marx has talked at length about class class exploitation so the marxists they continue to fuel the working class movements in the nation states uh, although there has been a heavy blow to class based movements after the collapse of the soviet union uh, and in the uh, socialism in the eastern europe in or during the 1990s now as the marxian perspective sees the society that society is the arena of social inequality so its approach reflects on how such inequality creates conflict and causes revolutionary sort of changes now the private ownership that is the basic bone of contention uh, within the marxist sociology of conflict that private ownership and primitive accumulation of property and capital labor exploitation economic inequality all these which are inbuilt in capitalism that geared up the marxian optimism for revolutionary social movements in the modern history so uh, the all this i mean the vices of uh, capitalism as seen by the marxists they are the prime movers of the class movements now working class or the proletariat with their labor power they can mobilize collective action against capitalist class or the bourgeoisie who owns the means of production and uh, by virtue of their ownership of means of production they also control the relations of production now what marx believes is that all the classes of capitalist society they will combine or they will ultimately get polarized into two i mean large blocks one is the haves that is composed of the bourgeoisie and the have nots composed of the proletariat so ultimately all the classes will be polarized into two i mean large camps or large blocks now such polarization when is possible it is possible only when the proletariats are able to develop their class consciousness that they initially they have a sort of consciousness i mean which is not very i mean they are unconscious at the beginning that is the stage termed by marx as class in itself that is a kind of unconscious class but under such conditions or under a, a due course of development the the proletariat they acquires class consciousness they gets transformed from what class in itself to class for itself and this class for itself stage indicates a level of consciousness where a revolutionary i mean movement can be uh, thought of or can take place now uh, what uh, we see is that that uh, there are different marxist theories Uh, say we have come across the names of lenin trotsky gramsci and mao zedong they put great emphasis on the ability of masses to overthrow the ruling classes so they have that ability they have that i mean i mean masses have that potentiality to overthrow the ruling classes in the early 20th century the marxists had witnessed localized collective actions in the early part of 20th century there have been local collective action against western capitalism scope was a bit i mean bit narrow but in the or after the after the second uh, world war they started talking about the importance and possibility of class conflicts against global capitalism so after the second world, world war the working class movements they uh, started or began to resist the spread of global capitalism consequently the marxian collective movement got dispersed and decentralized all over the world now the communist revolution of uh, uh, in russia in 1917 or spanish revolution of, uh, of 1936 in western europe and communist revolution of 1949 in china all these bear testimony to the strength of revolutionary social movement in altering the social and economic structure of any given society so the marxist 
they normally expect that the nature of the struggle of the oppressed should be violent. As the, exploiter, uh, as the exploiter class, they would hardly surrender their power without violence. So, it is normally that counter or, or resisting that power often involves counter violence. Yet, it is true that often it is not a necessary condition that revolutionary movement would be violent, uh, would be, would be violent. So, violence may be there, but that is not a necessary condition. It depends upon the state response, it depends upon the property class that if they take recourse to violence, then counter violence from the, from the proletariat can be expected. So, in that case revolution can be violent, but it is not a necessary condition that revolutionary movement would be violent. So, Marxists also predict that the communist social unrest often occur in industrial center because uh, industrial center is composed of the of the of the of the of the urban proletariats or the workers who are more conscious or who are potentially agitated to develop class consciousness because they face the capitalists exploitation more directly than their counterparts in the in the rural sector so the rural sectors they lag behind the rural sectors they lag behind consciousness the uh, of the of the of the of the of the urban proletariat so in the rural sector or in the agrarian sector uh, the peasants uh, as we have mentioned uh, about the peasants in, in many different types of discussions that peasant movements or farmers movement, the peasants in agricultural fields have less chance. It is not that they are not, they cannot be involved in revolutionary movement, but it is always in the urban centers or the industrial working class, they are in the leading I mean front of the revolutionary movement. So, it should be noted that the oppressed or repressed workers in Russia and impoverished peasants in China. So, in Russia, the movement was led by the repressed workers or oppressed workers and in China, it was led by the impoverished peasants. So, in one case, it is under the leadership of the workers in Russia and in another case, in China, it was under the leadership of the peasants who agitated by respective charismatic leaders, say in Russia, it was uh, Lenin and in, and in China, it was under the leadership of Mao Zedong that they fought the enemies or for the uh, capitalists. So, the and formation of trade union, of course, in the in the uh, in the case of urban areas or in the industrial sector, the formation of trade union also reflects communist ideology. It is not that trade unions do not reflect communist ideology, it trains workers in class struggle. Trade unions basically they are the trainer, they train the workers in class struggle and this class struggle is the necessary precondition to their self emancipation. Being exploited as a class, you need to be engaged in class struggle against your adversaries or against your enemies class enemies. So, that is a necessary precondition, but neo Marxists, there are some neo Marxists like say Gramsci who doubted the possibility of any historical law. You cannot formulate any uniform single law by which the working class movement would inevitably trump. So, maybe with class struggle or in a different form, he stressed on the need for popular workers education. Gramsci stressed the need for popular workers education to encourage development of intellectuals among the workers. and this he termed as organic intellectuals who understands the situation condition of the of the workers or the peasants so that they the manner in which the ruling class uh, uh, or the capitalists they manipulate the consent of the ruled so the ruled need to be uh, re-educated or the ruled need to generate their own intellectuals who can educate them about this I mean, I mean strategy of extending hegemony by the ruling class over the ruled. So, that has to be I mean broken. Changes, certain changes are taking place in contemporary capitalism, which have also prompted some sociologists like we have come across the name of say Darendorf, C. Wright Mills, Goldthorpe and others who doubt the orthodox philosophy of industrial conflict. As Marx was emphasizing on the on the importance of industrial working class as the vanguard of the, the revolutionary movement. So, these sociologists like Darendorf, C. Wright Mills, Goldthorpe and others, they have doubted the orthodox philosophy of industrial conflict. So, they have been critical about the role played by the working class in western capitalist society. Why? 
because in recent years there are there have been the emergence of certain new social movements like the women's movement like the environmentalist movements peace movements which have challenged the traditional expressions of class led movements so there is a contradiction there is a kind of contestation or claims and counter claims regarding the importance of class in leading the revolutionary movements and uh, eder eder's uh, revolution and he has reevaluated the the situation of the middle class and the subaltern studies the new field of subaltern studies which have stressed the importance of studying or constructing history from the below they have also contested some of the i mean basic hypotheses of marxian theory now the we are moving to the next theoretical approach that is structural functional approach the structural approach to social movements brings to the forefront of analysis the institutionalized injustices and inequalities over which contested politics are fought now according to this approach the formation of collective action means organizing activity and efforts so we are collectively organized uh, or collectively we are mobilized to challenge the status quo i mean the existing power structure and its relation so that is the status quo and it is being challenged now this approach links social movements with the rising aspirations of the people and with the rising aspirations the gap between expectations of the people and the system performance that i am expecting this and what i am getting out of that the as the gap widens as the gap increases the mass movements emerge creating political instability and political disorder so the structural functional theory is identified with the ideas of person structural functionalism explains the formation of social movements in this fashion another structural functionalist sociologist neil jess melser he has also explored six major structural conditions or factors which are responsible for social movement first the structural conduciveness which refers basically to a situation when a society is found to have serious and prolonged structural problems by which some people continue to live with low living standards or confront political repression so this is a structural i mean condition that uh, i mean i mean provokes people or that makes people uh, proactive that makes people uh, prepared to engage in collective mobilization against the structure now the movements emerged in the eastern europe in the near past where the reflection of such structural conduciveness uh, the next one is this that uh, this structural strain or structural uh, conduciveness they uh, the, they often i mean i mean lead people towards collective mobilization now the strains which are caused by social structure that i have already mentioned or the structural strains can spur social movement for instance say in the country like india the socially determined exclusion exclusion of the scheduled caste scheduled tribes or minority the inequity injustice or ethnic marginalization marginalization these all are the crucial factors behind social movements now the third uh, factor mentioned third structural factor mentioned by smelser is that that not only deprivation is enough to lead towards social mobilization what is important that the explanation how we are explaining the deprivation that is also crucial so structural strain or deprivation is there that automatically doesn't i mean lead towards social movement or social mobilization what is important how we are explaining that now the next factor as mentioned by smelser that is uh, discontentment or as a series of discontentment as the discontentment or the series of discontentment uh, prolongs there is the chance of a social movement and uh, fifth the mobilization for action as a factor becomes crucial in explaining the formation of social movement the solidarity movement in poland is the best example of this and finally according to smelser lack of social control if social control is lacking then there may be social mobilization against it social movement succeeds depending on the type of government response officials response response of the police and military if they are repressing then social movements can take place now the women's movement in india can be explained by the structural strain approach the traditional stereotype as we know uh, that women's images are highly traditionally stereotype uh, this perpetuate their domination by their fathers during young age by their husbands after marriage and by their sons during widowhood in india hereby causing strains now the job market also discriminates 
the women. Gender discrimination affects her choice of education, occupation and to the extent that even she cannot decide her marriage partner. So, it is possible to explain the rise of women's movement with reference to these structural strengths and inequalities. Now, we are coming to our third approach that is quite important for Indian context that is Gandhian approach. Now, Gandhian movement against racial discrimination in South Africa and against peasant exploitation, class repression, British rule, untouchability or gender discrimination in India have evolved some innovative trends. The non-violent, principally Gandhiji was uh, the, in the favor of non-violent social movements and both in India and abroad uh, Gandhians, Akhtar Gandhi, they have all put forward the cause of non-violent social movements and Gandhians believe in the confluence of both ends and means to evolve holistic and progressive forces through any social movement. So, both the ends and means are important to the uh, to Gandhi, Gandhiji and of course, uh, the Gandhians after him. Now, Gandhiji has led several movements in India, we know the most important one is the Sottagraho which he led in Champaran in Ahmedabad and Kheda. These movements were based on his experiences in South Africa. He first visited the places and had case studies on peasants and workers analyzed them objectively. In case of Champaran agitation against Tinkathia system in Bihar, he collected data from about 800 indigo cultivators and then analyzed the condition, their situation, their condition of production, profit, indigo cultivators rights and entitlements. Upon his insistence, a committee was formed and they exposed the exploitative, illegal and illegitimate character of indigo planters. Consequently, the indigo cultivators, what they received? The indigo cultivators got refunded the misappropriated profits, security of tenure and cropping, uh, I mean, freedom. So, in case of Ahmedabad Sotagroho, Gandhi studied and analyzed the actual cost and profit of mill owners and justified the grievances of workers on the basis of a tribunal insisted by him and increase their bonus up to 35 percent. Now, we will be highlighting certain idiosyncrasies or peculiarities or uniqueness of Gandhian methods. The first and of course, the most important is Shottagraho. Shottagraho as a method, we know that Shottagraho was a typical Gandhian method of resistance employed by him. This includes two units. First is Shottya. Shottya means truth and Agraho that is firm insistence or holding firmly that we are holding firmly or firmly believing in truth. Now, it is pursued through both dialectical process and dialogical resistance. As a dialectical process, Shottagraho is not a type of passive resistance as it is the weapon of the, uh, weapon of the strong. Shottagraho is the weapon of the strong. It is not that it is the weapon of the weak. It admits no violence under any circumstances and it insists most importantly upon truth that the term Shottya means that it insists upon truth. David Hardiman has termed this method as dialogical resistance and it is the adversary is because the adversary is not an enemy. There is no enemy as such. For instance, unlike Marxists, Gandhi did not believe in class antagonism and class struggle. So, there is no question of class enemy also. Now, Gandhian ideology stresses on truth as we have come across Ahimsa, Shottagraho, Khadi, Chorkas, Sadeshi, Trusteeship, etc. Now, for Gandhi, the people, this is quite important ideological dimension of Gandhi that the people who win the heart and mind of the opponents voluntarily, the strongest and the bravest are called as Shottagrohi. So, you have to win the heart and mind of the opponents also. He applied his unique strategy of first unto death in many notable occasions like after 1922 Chodi Chowra incident, 1934 communal award incident and in 1947 Hindus and Muslims communal violence that took place in Bengal and Delhi. The Gandhian approach to conflict resolution hence goes beyond the approaches of conflict management and dispute settlement of modern type. In independent India after Gandhi. Uh, so many leaders have applied Gandhian strategy like Binoba Bhave in Budan movement, Medha Patkar in Narmada Bacha Vandalan and Anna Hazare in anti-corruption movements, they have applied successfully Gandhian strategies. Leaders of peace movements and many other social movements around the world, they have also relied on Gandhian path of Shottagraho. Then uh, we are uh, moving to our uh, next uh, approach that is resource mobilization theory. The resource mobilization theory is 
the resource mobilization theory it is uh, talks about the social movement that is likely to succeed or even set up grounds without substantial resources. So, if you do not have substantial resources, you cannot succeed with a social movement or you can start a social movement. The well defined antecedents to collective action, the structural deprivation and strengths as we have mentioned earlier, conflicts and contestation alone may not cause social movements. So, these are not the necessary conditions. The necessary condition is that that you have to have resources at your command. The effective and efficient use of resources, it may be human resource, it may be social, physical or financial resource that can drive social movements. Social movements result or emanates out of these resources. Now, deprivation theory is there and unlike this theory, resource mobilization approach points out that though deprivation is indispensable, deprivation has to be there. but it requires mobilization of resources to cause social movements. Now, both internal and external resource mobilization contribute in the formation of social movement. Resource may be internal, may be external. If the insiders lack adequate resources, then the outsiders may instill them. So, for instance, we can see that the black poor people may be united by the white activists or the females may be organized by the males. So, the males are supplying the important resources to the women's movement. So, that is external resource. Now, the internet including social media, Facebook, Twitter, political campaign through YouTube, these are all used as vital resources to uh, organize any social movement. Now, we are moving to another important approach of social movement that is relative deprivation theory. This relative deprivation theory, Edgar has explored this in his famous book, Why Men Rebel that why people engage in political violence that was the question before God and how do regimes respond to he examines the psychological frustration aggression theory to him frustration always not necessarily lead to violence but only when it becomes sufficiently prolonged then relative deprivation drives collective violence depending upon the intensity and scope of deprivation that is the basic issue that how do you feel the deprivation that will lead you towards collective mobilization and this relative deprivation term was first used by Samuel Stoffer and later by Robert Martin to refer to a situation where the persons perceive that they have less than they deserve. That is the important thing with relative deprivation theory. So, uh, uh, Gar have always, Gar has always tried to explain why individuals, group and communities join social movements and he has outlined three types of deprivation. The first one is decremental deprivation, the second one is aspirational deprivation and the third one is progressive deprivation. What decremental deprivation means? That when value capabilities of a given population decline due to one or several national disasters to guard the success of Bolsheviks in Russia in seizing powers that Bolsheviks seized power in Russia in 1917 was largely due to decremental deprivation. Russian people suffered from enormous material and human sacrifices. Uh, during the first world war and that uh, led towards decremental deprivation. Now, aspirational deprivation occurs when the value capabilities of a group remain constant while the value expectations increase. Finally, progressive deprivation occurs when value capabilities stabilize or decline after a period when value capabilities and value expectations have increased together. Guard cites the examples of rioting in colonies when liberalizing tendencies and reforms did not result. So, in the study of social movements, the sociological approaches which we have discussed uh, in this uh, present uh, discussion, in spite of their divergences, there are divergences, they can become a theoretical guide for comprehending the dynamics of social movements. You can understand that uh, what is a social movement, how can we analyze the social movements, what are the underlying trends of the movements through uh, adhering to these approaches. Now, a reassessment of the approaches that we have uh, undertaken in this module uh, that definitely articulates a prospect or throws a prospect or throws a better scope for understanding for the sociology of revolution. So, in the in the study that uh, or, or, or throughout the approaches what we have seen is that that all the approaches be it the Marxian or the Gandhian or the structural functional or the resource mobilization theory or the relative deprivation theory. What are the theories may be? First thing is that there is collective mobilization. The question is how to understand, how to analyze collective mobilization and the theories differ in these 
viewpoint that the Marxist define or analyze it from the standpoint of class where resource mobilization theory analyzes it from the standpoint of resource that how or what amount of resource you have in your or at your command what resource you can employ that will determine whether there will be a social movement or not where Gandhiji Gandhiji entirely depended on a different strategy that is Shottagraho, non-violence and even even winning the heart of the opponents that is I mean that is a crucial hallmark of Gandhian philosophy that you you need to be tolerant not only to the extent that you are uh, you are explaining the situation to your uh, friends or, or your comrades. The thing is that that you have to win the hearts of the opponents also that is Shottagraho whereas in structural functional approach we see that the challenge is against the structural strains that is being caused by the structure and Neil J. Smelsar or Talcott persons they have all talked about the structural strains. So in this sense all the movements they have certain differing standpoints it is true that they all analyze collective mobilization from their different different standpoints but we need to understand the core analytical thrash of all these approaches how these approaches differently view the social mobilization or collective mobilization which we know as social movements at the field because movements take place at the field from outside we are analyzing it in that sense all these approaches makes us analytically powerful to explore social movements for that matter to explore society itself thank you